Thank you, Steve. Hi, everybody. It's so good to be back with you here in Medford this morning. Um, we have a, a second reading today uh, from a, the book of Nehemiah. I'm sure everyone's favorite, one you uh, read all the time. Uh, we're going to be reading from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8, starting in verse 1, going through verse 10. When the seventh month came, the people of Israel being settled in their towns, all the people gathered together into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. The scribe Ezra stood on a wooden platform that had been made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Maaseiah on his right hand, and Padiah, Mishael, Malchijah, Hashem, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam on his left hand. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen and Amen lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshua, Benai, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Maseah, Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah, the Levites, helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. So they read from the book, from the law of God, with interpretation. They gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now after 70 years in captivity, the exiled people of Israel have now returned to Jerusalem. And as it happens, power had shifted and a new empire, Persia, had advanced to the top of the food chain. And when they took Babylon, who had been holding Israel captive, Persia gave the people of Israel permission to return to Judea, to the city of Jerusalem. This is what was going on in the time of Nehemiah the governor and Ezra the scribe. Now, it had taken them several years with much conflict and arduous work to actually make their return. They had rebuilt some of the city, including the temple, but nothing was yet quite the way that it had been before. Even though they had returned home, Israel didn't automatically regain the same sense of identity that they had had before. They'd been separated from one another for a long time alienated from the stories of their past, and now they lacked a shared vision for their future. Some had gotten married to other people from other traditions while they were in exile. They had kids and, and built whole new lives. When their community became fractured, they had all learned to survive in new ways. But now, thanks to shifting political winds and the echoes of their history, the people of Israel were now back in Judea, back in Jerusalem, and they were starting to settle in, but they were still very much contending for this, their, their sense of who they were. 
And the narrative of scripture, the people of Israel are God's chosen people set apart for a special purpose. But at this point in their history, we can see that however true that might have been, that sense of purpose might have felt a little fragile. Coming back to the city, rebuilding the temple that had been destroyed, restoring some of the old familiar rhythms of life, none of that was enough to fully inspire that sense of grounding that comes in knowing who you are and where you belong and what you stand for, especially as a community. Now for Israel, that grounding had always been in the covenant that God had made with them, that God would be their God and that they would be God's people. And like the vows and promises made at the beginning of a marriage, the fidelity of both God and Israel were meant to be embodied, put into practice through the law. God's promise was to be faithful to the people, and the people's promise was to be faithful to God by being faithful to the law, which had been given to them through Moses. Now, Ezra was a scribe, which means he was a scholar of the law. And he had been in exile himself, but he had been sent back by the king, back to Jerusalem to get temple worship back on track and to tend to the people's spiritual lives and the life of this community of faith by beginning again to teach them the scriptures, the law. And in today's reading from the book of Nehemiah, it seems that the people were actually quite hungry for what Ezra had to offer. The people all gathered together in an outdoor square and told Ezra to bring out the book of the law of Moses. And so from early morning until midday, Ezra stood up on a platform and read from scroll after scroll of the Torah. Ezra's whole team of priests, all of those names that may sound a little unfamiliar in your ear, they certainly felt unfamiliar on my tongue, this whole team of priests fanned out through the crowd, answering questions and providing clarity so that everyone could understand what was being read. And in that reading, the people heard the words of the law, the commandments about worship and relationships and how to deal with one another, but they also heard stories, their stories, the stories of their people, the stories of their successes and their defeats, of their moments of obedience and their seasons of unfaithfulness. They're the same kinds of conflicting accounts that make us scratch our heads today when we read scripture. They heard the disparity between stories of God's immense patience and mercy and other stories of war and merciless violence that seems at times to be sanctioned by God. They heard stories of individuals risking everything for the good of the people and they heard stories of their ancestors succumbing to disgrace. They all probably heard stories they had never heard before, commandments that sounded really difficult and confusing, and surprising glimpses into what God might actually be looking for in this relationship between humanity and the divine. Some of them heard in Ezra's reading commandments that would later be used to force them to divorce their non-Hebrew spouses and send them and their own children away from Jerusalem back into exile without them. Some of them heard in Ezra's reading stories that would inspire the building of a wall around their city to protect their set-apart identity in the name of ascribing glory to God, their rock, and their defender. They all heard stories and commandments read that day whose influence stretches forcefully even into this generation and affects even now how power can be distributed, how marginal voices can be silenced, and how the demonization and dehumanization of people can be justified, even through the use of a holy and sacred text. So it comes as no big surprise to me that all of the people wept when they heard the words of the law read aloud to them. I know that the reading of the Bible has certainly elicited the same response from me more than once. Now, I know in your current ser sermon series, you've been taking a look at the half-truths that often crop up in our conversations about the Christian faith. And one such half-truth is taking a 
God said it, I believe it, that settles it approach to scripture. I wish that our holy book was as simple as all that. But as Ezra's congregation knew, and as we know, scripture is complicated. It can be hard to read, and I would venture if it isn't a little hard, you might not be doing it right. It requires patience and a willingness to wrestle. It was true for those in Ezra's assembly who called upon this roving team of priests to answer their questions, and it's true for us now. The Bible is both a textbook and a cautionary tale. It is history and myth intertwined. It's poetry that we all too often try to break down like math problems. It contradicts itself in places, and it is kind of a fact-checking nightmare. Scripture lays bare humanity's flaws, and it reminds us of how we have all time and again tried to cast God in our own image. But these ancient texts also make up a beautiful account of humanity's reckoning with desire and virtue and power and love. And it bears witness to this relationship maintained between God and humanity from the very beginning. The Bible is a book of grief and a book of joy. Some of you may be familiar with the work of Brene Brown. She's a social scientist whose research focuses on wholehearted living, which she defines as engaging in our lives from a place of worthiness. That is, operating from a belief that you are worthy of love and belonging, and then living a life that speaks authentically to that belief. Now, according to Dr. Brown, this kind of living necessitates vulnerability, which she defines as having the courage to show up when you cannot control the outcome. I think that definition is worth hearing one more time. Vulnerability is having the courage to show up even when you can't control the outcome. Now, Dr. Brown describes joy, not fear and not shame, but joy as the most vulnerable emotion that we feel. And the image that she uses to illustrate this is one of a parent standing over their sleeping child and being so truly, madly, deeply, doubtlessly in love with that child that this love brings about peak joy. And in the same second, that parent is caught up with a foreboding and an intense wave of fear that something terrible may happen to that child. This is the vulnerability of joy. When we experience joy, in that moment when our, when our cups runneth over and we are grateful and we have everything that we could ask for, the vast majority of us cannot separate out from that joy just how fragile and temporary it might be. We wouldn't cry at weddings if we didn't know just how much was at stake. We wouldn't cry at funerals except for knowing that we've lost something truly worth having. And we wouldn't weep when babies were born save for knowing just how valuable and precarious and beautifully delicate life is. And so when wonderful things happen, we humans, we kind of brace ourselves. It can be hard to let ourselves fully celebrate because what if victory is fleeting? What if celebration only invites disaster? What if we let off the gas and we lose our momentum? What about that pesky other shoe that will inevitably drop? And I wonder if this wasn't a bit what was going on in the crowd that day as Ezra read the law. Here they are, no longer in exile, but not yet fully arrived at home in the place of their truest identity and their deepest sense of belonging. The joy of God's mercy, of God's steadfast and faithful love for them couldn't be torn away from their guilt or their anxiety or their sense that it was all so fragile. Slavery 
oppression, famine, war, exile, it could all happen again. Not to mention there's the matter of the hard work of cultivating this relationship with their God and returning to the rhythms of worship and allowing God to draw them back to the covenant between them with the tether of the law. Could they do it? Would their faith ever feel like enough? I think as a people of faith, we often feel this same pull between joy and grief. We hold on to the joy of believing that we, too, are loved by God and called according to a purpose, to know that we are worthy of love and belonging, and to believe that God is not only capable of redeeming all things, but has done so and makes all things new in Christ. Even while grasping tightly to that joy, the grief of living in a world that still bears the marks of brokenness can be overwhelming and bring us to our knees. It threatens our hope and makes that tether that binds us to God feel stretched far too long. In the Christian, Christian tradition, we hear the same law and stories that Ezra read that day along with the prophets and the gospels and the letters to the early church. And in these scriptures, we hear our own stories. We hear passages that have comforted us in times of trial. And we also hear verses that have been hurled as weapons. We see the conflicts that our ancestors in faith had over what to eat and who should be allowed in and who shouldn't be placed in charge and where the money ought to go. And we're reminded, aren't we, of our own church conflicts? No better or worse or all that different than theirs. We stand there in the assembly with these former exiles. We stand along with them listening to these words and hoping to hear in them a word from God that will bring us joy. The, the joy that will remain and be made complete and will not be taken away. Some of the scrolls that we pick up and read may be vessels of that word. Some may only cause the floodgates of our tears to open more. And because scripture is so complicated, so easily misunderstood, so susceptible to misuse, it may be tempting to plug our ears and protect ourselves from the parts of it that have been used as weaponry against us or those that we love. It may be tempting to put our copies of the Bible on the highest shelf and write it off as the unlikeliest source of joy that there is. I'm a preacher getting a PhD in preaching and that temptation is all too real for me. But in avoiding the grief that might come through scripture sometimes, we miss out on the joy that is available to us when we have the courage to show up even though we cannot control the outcome. We miss out on the joy of the actual word of God, the word that became flesh and dwelled among us in Jesus Christ, the word of relentless grace that never gives up on us, the word of love that against all odds, the Holy Spirit often delivers to us even through this profanely sacred text of the Bible. We hear this word in the colors and rhythms of the creation story in Genesis, and it returns to us in the laws of Sabbath and Jubilee. This word of God comes by way of an audible voice and the roar of the water in the story of the Exodus that then echo back in the baptism of Jesus at the River Jordan and reverberate into our own baptism liturgy and the water from a font on a baby's head. The word of the Lord came to Ezra's holy and perfect community and to the communities of Bethlehem and Nazareth and Corinth and Ephesus and Rome and Medford. This word of hope comes through something as mundane as bread and juice or as radical as the prophet's calls for acts of kindness and justice. The word of the Lord is that which grounds us in our faith, that which reminds us of who we are and where we belong and what we stand for, which is that we are God's very own, loved with an unbreakable covenantal love, 
And as those who follow Christ, we stand for our neighbor, for the other, for the poor and the captive and the voiceless and the powerless. We stand for love, believing that the hope of resurrection is the final word over the power of death and despair. And if we set our Bibles or, or our regard for it on a high shelf, we can avoid a lot of grief. I know that the temptation to do that is very real. But friends, I invite you to have courage. Though you know not whether joy or grief await you, Though there is much within the laws and the stories of the Bible that can bring tears to our eyes and questions to our hearts. The word who became flesh and dwelled among us might be an unknown word to us without it. If we're willing to look for it, there's a winding path of love traced through the pages of the Bible that always leads toward joy. So when you're standing there vulnerable, Encountering these words from ancient scrolls, friends, do not mourn or weep, for the joy of the Lord is our strength, and that joy is more than worth the search. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for the gift of Scripture. And we thank you, God, for the gift of the Holy Spirit that enables mere words on a page to become for us a word of life. We pray that you would guide us as we seek to understand the role that Scripture plays in our lives and in the life of our church. And we pray that your, your word would come back to us over and over that we may be a people who are constantly reminded that we stand for love and justice and joy. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.